know because people recognize my name and I get your emails too. And others are completely new to me, so I'm very, very excited about getting to know all of you. Um, this is uh, one um, of the activities offered by the Bayou Culture Collaborative. Um, this is an idea that I can blame that man on. <laughs> uh, it, um, Jonathan Foray had a conversation with, um, uh, well, after the uh, CPEX Rising Above Symposium, where he said, What about the culture in this whole process of uh, the coast and the restoration? And then he talked with people at Nichols, um, and I got drawn into that, and together we designed the Bayou organizations. And um, I'm really excited that uh, it's being supported by the Louisiana Division of the Arts, by the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area. Um, but the Bayou Culture, what we're doing is trying to find strategies that will help sustain the cultures of the coast. And so we're experimenting. Uh, last spring, we experimented with a lot of things. And this year, we're focusing on two strains. One is workshops where we pay a tradition bearer to pass on a tradition. And Janie Luster just recently uh, gave a workshop on Homa palmetto weaving. And her daughter, Ann Luster, there you are, uh, gave a workshop on Spanish moss. Um, uh, doll making and, and other related crafts with Spanish moss. Um, and we're, we're, I'm talking with a number of people on, on strategies like that. We're looking at all the coastal parishes. But the second one of strategy is to start bringing artists and really eventually all of the cultural leaders into the coastal restoration conversation. We're very excited that uh, LA Safe Plan absolutely embraces what they refer to as the human dimension. And so I'm working with a number of people to develop strategies on how that would happen. My, but several months ago, I said, we gotta get the artists engaged. And I know that many of you artists are already engaged in the coast and uh, environmental activism, and we're featuring some of, the, some of you here. Um, and so I'm very, I recognize that I'm very late to this conversation, but I want to make my contribution of how we can push it forward and get more people dialoguing. Um, so logistics. Oh, and I, I, I want to mention that this is happening just because Sam Oliver happened to mention to Cat Cheryl Castile that what can I do to help move this forward. And then we ended up partnering with, with them on this. And they have been fabulous. The Acadiana Center for the Arts has just been an amazing partner for this. Um, the conversation with Jonathan, you know, look what followed. So speak up. My, my, I request that you speak up about what you think needs to be happening um, how, if you want to get involved. I might not be able to accommodate everybody, but together we can come up with appropriate strategies to address the human dimension of the uh, coastal uh, land loss issues. I um, also want to acknowledge the Louisiana Folklore Society. They have been a, an amazing uh, partner in this um, and uh, will continue to be. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Maida. I'm Patty Bowman. I'm founding director of Local Learning, the National Network for Folk Arts and Education. And um, why folklore? Why is the folklore standing here with you? Why are Maida and I involved in this? I wanted to salute Al Hussein, who recently retired from the National Science Foundation Informal Science Education Division. Two years ago, he began a series of conversations introducing folklorists and scientists. He grasped how inherently interdisciplinary folk life is, how dynamic our field is, and he helped craft my organization's call for submissions for our journal of folklore and education issue on environmental humanities. Uh, he also introduced me to people at Tulane, who in turn introduced me to Brandon, and here we all are together in this room. So a little shout out to Al Bessena. 
Local Learning, my organization, has a long history of working with the Louisiana Division of the Arts Folklife Program and with cultural organizations here in Lafayette. I have learned so much about Acadiana from working with many of you, and I am deeply attached to your place and to your people. Social scientists like folklorists, cultural geographers, anthropologists are attuned to place as a nexus of cultural, historical, economic, environmental, and interpersonal relations and forces. Sense of place connects the local to the regional and the global, and today this concept connects all of us. Whatever our field, the arts, humanities, science, all learning is situated in cultural frameworks. And today we're going to swim in the nexus of academic, popular, and traditional culture. Brandon, will this clicker work? Do we know? Can I change my what's? I don't think the clicker is working. Okay. So Paige, would you Yeah. I, you don't want me to touch this. <laughs> Trust me. And you don't want me to start a copy anything either. Do you want it? So, there we go. So, today I want, we're going to be swimming in this nexus. Um, academic and high culture. You go to school, you get a PhD in biology, you get a PhD in folklore, you're teaching. Popular culture, viral anti vaccine videos are flooding us daily. We've got all this popular culture coming at us. And in this country, we often overlook this third circle of traditional culture. And yet, no matter how sophisticated we are, it's where we live most of our life. What is important to us? How do you do your job? How do you raise your children? What do you believe about the cosmos? Toilet paper over or under? <laughs> <laughs> what do you absolutely have to eat at Thanksgiving? So that folk life circle is where I live, and I work with teachers and artists all over the country, helping teachers understand folklore dynamic in the present, your students have cultural identity that they need to understand. You can't go studying other people until you study yourself. So I teach ethnography to teachers. Um, next slide, and this is the last one. Paige, thank you. So I want to, I want to frame today by uh, referencing our journal of folklore and education issue. You all have a little card, uh, Common Ground People in Our Places. Our guest editor is folklorist Tim Frandy, who is Finnish and indigenous Sami from northern um, Wisconsin. That's the cover of last year's issue. He wrote of the deep significance of berries among his people in northern Wisconsin. Our well-being is intertwined with webs and relations beyond the human community. <coughs> talking about the weather or berries is the same as talking about ourselves. Picking berries shapes who we are and how we interact with our place. Berries are how we think, how we understand, how we remember. Berries affect how we want and expect land to be managed. Berries reflect and shape who we regard as family. You don't share good patches with just anyone. And a set of all customs dictates the etiquette and norms of appropriate and inappropriate berry picking behaviors, which usually supersede written law. But what I'm trying to get at is not simply about berries. As the seasons change, we fish, hunt, garden, gather, knock rice, tap trees, cut firewood, reuse and repurpose the things around us in a variety of creative ways. <laughs> Together, these customary practices shape our sense of time, our sense of place, and our sense of self. We belong to the place, it does not belong to us. We belong to this bigger web of relations in which we have what many indigenous scholars refer to as relational accountability. Many of these things I learned at home through dialogue and firsthand observation over decades. My brother and I learned to read the woods. These relatively simple tidbits of traditional knowledge are not static, but rather interpretive, generative, dynamic, creative, and participatory. So substitute crawfish, shrimp, oysters, <coughs> sugar cane. I mean, this to me speaks of this region. You are constantly reusing and repurposing. You are so aware of the season around 
and the changes that are happening. So um, I wanted you to, to have those words from the folklorist of why folk life? Um, well, this is why. It's about sense of place, which we're going to be talking about more later. Um, but to, to start our morning, I want to ask um, Corinne Park to come and give us a, a welcoming prayer to, um, from the Homa people. Thank you. Would you bow your head, please? O Senhor, I will merci pour chaque personne qui ici. I will say, man, que vous bien à venir le pays ici qui nous donne tout ça qu'on a besoin naturel. I will say, merci Dieu pour le banlieu, les rivières et les bois. Et tout ça qu'on a un peu donné notre service pour aider us pour ne pas quitter ce place ici aujourd'hui avec pas appris ça qu'on quoi pour amener les nous autres. Un vous merci Dieu et un vous qu'on vous reste avec nous autres et chaque personne ici. Amen. Amen. Merci. So our first presenter today is Janie Lester, whose people have long been aware of their place and the changes affecting Homa land and life. She's a master palmetto basket weaver and cultural preservationist of the United Homa Nation. She's been inducted into the Louisiana Hall of Master Folk Artists. As everybody was introducing themselves this morning, such great people doing great things, and I'm saying, what am I doing up here? Well. One of the questions I want to ask you, most of us remember where we were when 9-11 happened, right? Mm -hmm. I was at my doctor's office and he had his TV playing and I still remember that scene. But do you remember when we lost the first, those are y'all, those are y'all from Louisiana, do you remember when we lost the first football field into the Gulf? You know, I remember hearing about it and saying, wow, you know. And then I got on the council. I served eight years on the tribal council, and I started going to meetings, meetings that we were discussing from Organza to the Gulf. I think one of the things that stuck with me is that some of our communities were going to be left out. Some of our communities were going to be left out, meaning some of our people were going to be left out. And the other thing I remember is that we talked about the Barrier Islands. And this morning I realized that, you know, the Barrier Islands out in the Gulf are there. And we talked about them. And my community was going to become a Barrier Island eventually. And I think we are all barrier islands, you know. Myself, I look at what we lose, and, and if I don't protect that, it's going to be gone. And we've seen with our homo community, we lost so much. Um, and I can give you the view, the homo Indians were not allowed into the school system till the mid-50s. Uh, we had Indian schools, and then when integration, came in, we were allowed into the public school system. So my parents and grandparents didn't have any education. They had good common sense. They had knowledge of what was happening around them. I don't remember when that happened, that first football field, but I do remember my mom and dad discussing what was going on with their sassafras trees. And they knew that it was coming from the hurricanes that flooded us. It would leave that salt water behind. Mom always grew a garden and things weren't growing like they used to. And so, you know, I heard for many, many years how that was all affecting us. I have a son that's 39 and as a young boy like this, we took pictures 
but the uh, sassafras trees where my mom would pick the leaves to make this fine powder that we call phyllo. Those trees are gone. My parents are gone also. But that phyllo tree, we can't find in our community anymore. The art of making it, there's only one family that I know that's making this. So there's many, many things being lost. The ways of life is affecting all of us, especially our tribal communities. I didn't write down what I was gonna say. And even with uh, coming in this morning, I knew I wasn't gonna speak about Ile de Jean Charles. Y'all seen the headlines, y'all seen it on TV. You know, a whole community uh, that they wanna relocate. And I know what happened to the community in Grand Caillou. I think before Andrew hit us, we had like 5,000 residents in that area. Today, we might have 1,500. Our people are moving. And it's so sad to see communities and the government's not making it easier for them to stay. They even relocated our schools in that community. Uh, our high school students catch the bus about six o'clock in the morning to go to town for the high school. The elementary and the middle school are now maybe within five miles of home. You know, I always said, I'm not gonna move from the Bayou. That's my home, that's you know, my sense of place. I grew up there, that's all I knew. But our younger generation, they're not gonna go through the hurricanes like we read. They're not gonna wanna deal with the cleanup, with the mildew and everything. They wanna move, like we say, up the bayou, you know, which is just north. If you came 30 years ago, you would find our people at the end of the bayous. Today, they move in north of the bayou. Some are completely moving to Baton Rouge area. We have a really healthy community in Baton Rouge to St. Tammany. So like I say, we losing so much. Doing our basket classes, uh, I did one with the tribe. We had a young woman that drove from Baton Rouge so she could take this class. She grew up in July. Her aunt was uh, Marie Dean, and she wanted to make sure that she would learn this. Same thing with our classes that we did uh, for two weeks, you know. They wanted to learn. Uh, I have the picture in my mind. It was a whole family, even the father. Uh, we went to the people, it's the other thing, with our workshops, uh, which made it a little bit easier than them coming to us. We had planned to do the workshops at Ann's home, but talking, school has started, so many activities have started, and it was gonna be, you know, they could come on this day, but not that day. Well, we had an invitation with our local recreation center. We went there to where the families were. This one man that took the class, he came in late one day, his hands all greasy, the fingernails. I mean, I love that picture. So eager to want to learn. And what happened there, the whole family took the class. And so they have their own support system. The staff was even able to work, which uh, we had two homeless people there. And one of the ladies, her daughter has moved already. So like I say, our people are moving and we losing some of these, you know, traditional things, way of life that we've always known. And it's really sad, you know, uh, we have to be a sacrifice community in a sense. And it hurts, but yet we have to do our part. You know, we may not be able to save the land, but we can save some of this culture that we are losing. And I think it really hit me <clears throat> seeing Maida talk about uh, on the video, it really hit home with me at that point that it's not the Palmetto, uh, I guess 2011, I think we had a conference on weaving, basket, uh, weaving, 
and the Chilmachi uh, planet River Cane. And I said, well, you know, our palmetto's also endangered because, you know, salt water, uh, erosion. Then the levee system was coming through where my dad used to harvest palmetto. They built levees, that's all gone. And so I was really worried about the palmetto. But after seeing Maida's video, the palmetto's all over Louisiana. It's gonna be there. But it's our people that are leaving. It's the culture that we're losing. We lost this style of basket weaving. It's called the Homa Half Hitch. The, uh, we wove it for over 300 years. The last ones were done in the early 1940s. It wasn't passed on. So I know exactly how it feels to lose something. We were very fortunate that when the oil industry came into being in South Louisiana, the good and the bad, the good part was that some of the workers bought the baskets and they donated them to museums. And I was able to learn this basket form from the curator of the Denver Art Museum, the late Mr. Richard Cohn. And so we know what it is to lose something. And we also know what it is to find it again. It's a feeling that you can't describe. And I see this being lost so many things. Our language, uh, our home language. Uh, we do school presentations in November. And we would go uh, into the schools and say, raise your hand if you know what a shawi is. And boy, those hands would go up. What is a patasa? Those hands would go up. I mean, you know, a whole room, most of them knew what it was. Today, when we say that, there's some hesitation like they never heard it before. You might have maybe three or four kids that know what a shawi and patasa is. So you see, it's, we're losing it, and I'm really worried about that. So I wanna make sure that I do my part. And I was so excited that we were able to do these workshops, especially working with Anne, and my youngest daughter. Uh, I think I was described, I think maybe by Maida at one time that when we did festivals with my parents, my parents, like I said, didn't have the education, so we had to bring them, my husband and I, along with my first four children. And so, you know, I didn't realize, you know, they were coming with us, they were helping us, they were helping my, my parents. But Anne would sit there with my mom when she was making filet, when she was doing the mall styles. She sat there with me doing palmetto weaving. And, you know, you don't realize as you go on what children are picking up. And she's the one that really has carried on a lot of the traditional works that my family has carried. Uh, my family can do the palmetto huts that my dad used to do. She can do that. And so, like I said, we are doing our part as much as we can to preserve our culture down here in South Louisiana. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> So Brandon asked me to talk about loss, and I've had this idea that I've been thinking about of the future of loss and what we might lose in the future in the scientific view based on what I work on. And so I wanted to start by thanking Brandon. So this crude life exhibit is part of a grant that we got, and he's done this beautiful job not just to bring it here and to the museum where I work, this is the Museum of Natural Science at LSU's campus. You should all go there. It's free. Um, but he's also brought it down to rural areas. You know, this guy drinking a Bud Light, I don't know if you can tell, drinking Bud Light, he's tattooed up. He probably wouldn't walk into a museum, right? And so he's learning about loss from the oil spill based on what Brandon is showing him and, and bringing uh, this crude life exhibit to rural communities. Um, and also kids, you know, kids for the first time are learning, maybe they weren't even born during the oil spill, but they're learning about the impact of the spill, you know, 10 years, almost 10 years later. Um, but it started, for me, this journey for, for true life and working with Brandon started with the pancake bathfish. And this beautiful animal, which I brought actually, was on the cover of CNN.com. And the reason for that is um, 
the description that we created for the species came out during the oil spill. And so people were interested in it. Actually, so I, people have mentioned being from New York. I, I grew up in New York City. And I moved to Louisiana in 2008. And my first expedition out into the Gulf was ended up with us discovering two new species there, including this pancake bass. So there's new things still out there, even in the Gulf of Mexico. Are you guys OK? Am I, am I standing in the wrong place? Is that OK? Um, so I felt like a Louisianan for the first time. So my sense of place for Louisiana happened during the oil spill. I really became a Louisianan during this 16 weeks. And you know, because the description of that pancake bath fish came out during the spill, people would ask me, so what's the, what's the impact of the oil spill on this spe new species? And I'd say, well, part of its range is in the region of the spill. And that's not a very scientific answer. And that sort of led to this program that we wrote that allowed us to map um, museum records with where the spill was at the time, so in real time, and then in the 16-week overall period. And um, this led, believe it or not, to this art and science collaboration. And this program allowed us to map each of these red fish represents a museum specimen that's in a museum like at LSU and CAS is California Academy, USNM is Smithsonian. Each of those represents a jar in a shelf at a museum. That's a data point for telling us where these species are found. And the green is the oil spill. And so we could say, look, this is the actual range this species has and how much of the oil spill is impacting it. Um, and then again, this led to this art and science collaboration through the National Academies of Sciences that funded Brandon and I. Um, but I also wanted to talk about place, and I, I think about water as an ichthyologist. You know, this oil spill, it seems so huge to us, right? Being in Louisiana is still a big impact. And people don't realize how little water there is in the world. All the world's water is here, in this big 860-mile diameter ball. Even when I show scientists, they don't believe this. This is from US Geological Survey. That's all the world's water. All the world's water in all the oceans, all the world's fresh water, which is also represented in those smaller balls. But all the water in you and your dog is in that one ball. So there's not as much water as we would think. These are the places I travel. I don't usually, I, when I came here, I did not think I would work on Louisiana stuff. And I usually don't. So I just came back from Haiti. We're going to Thailand in a few months. I'm working on fishes around the world so that we can discover new species. We could discover these new species and add to the tree of life, which is really what I work on. And these are the new species I've been lucky enough to have discovered. And as a natural historian, I use that gateway drug because people like new species and they like natural history to teach them about evolution and genomics. And you didn't sign up for this, but you're going to get a little evolution and genetics lecture. And I want to talk about this stuff because when this era of post-truth, right? So you can say whatever you want, and some people will believe you. And I want what I teach is people to tell people how to figure out this information on their own. So when I teach, I teach students how to get this information so they don't have to believe the talking head in front of the room, including me. But I want to explain a little bit about this. So I'm a, I work on genetics. Sometimes I work on full genomes of animals. That's the totality of the DNA that's in an organism. And we're in this genomic tsunami. We're getting all this data, and we don't know how to under, we don't understand it, and we don't understand what to do with it. And this includes us. How many of you have done a, a DNA test? Right? OK, I'm going to throw some some salt on it a little bit, maybe some water. Let's say water. <laughs> um, so people are st sending their spit and their money to 23andMe to study their genome. You're not getting the whole genome. You're getting parts of your DNA sampled to study where you're from. So this is your sense of place genetically. And people get this wrong. And I, I try to separate the difference between genealogy and ancestry. So ancestry is like who you're actually related to, who your family is, who your actual relatives are. Genealogy is more, what does your DNA tell you about that ancestry? And it's not a straightforward relationship. So both sides of the political spectrum have sent us down a slippery slope. So here on the right is a group of white supremacists drinking milk in cold weather 
to show that they have the lactase mutation that allows them to drink milk into adulthood. Right? That's a mutation that occurred in Northern Europe, but also in West Africa and other parts of the world. Yeah. Why they're drinking milk in cold weather shirtless, that's probably part of the 2% Neanderthal that people of European descent, <laughs> people of European still have. And 2% is a huge amount. You don't have 2% the you don't have 2% left from your great, great, great grandfather. Right? So there was a, a huge amount of hybridization going on in Northern Europe. They're not celebrating that part. But even the other part of the political spectrum, um, Elizabeth Warren sent us down a very slippery slope not by claiming anything about her cultural heritage, but because she used a DNA test to do it. You might have 0% Native American genealogy left, gene genealogical history left, and have ancestors that were Native American. You might have zero left. So that's why we don't use these tests in any legal manner to claim any of our ancestry. Thank and I'll, God. what's that? Thank God. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> and so the reason for that is you can be 25% more Japanese or Indian or Native American than your sister on these same tests. Okay, and that's because your genome, totality, the totality of your genome, your DNA, is a salad. Okay, and you get half that salad from your mom and half from your dad. Okay, and your sister gets half, but a different half. Okay, and you might be a family of Italian salads, so your genome's all mixed up, you're a salad. You might be a family of Italian salads. You might have a Greek ancestor six generations ago, and she ends up with all that feta cheese, and you get none. <laughs> yeah. So you can't use these to prove your Native American ancestry like she was trying to do. And so don't let anybody claim it away from you. But you're also 95% chimpanzee. You know, most of our DNA is exactly the same as what we find in a chimpanzee. You're 60% banana. Right, so we celebrate those little differences that don't matter. It's, we're really one tree of life, right? And we're very, very similar to each other. These are twin girls. I have identical twin girls. These are not identical twins, but these are twin girls that would probably check off different boxes for race when they grow up. And you know, somebody who's studying zoology, who's studying the tree, I could tell you that sex, sexuality, race, Gender are things on a spectrum throughout the world, throughout life, and it's no different in human beings. So we celebrate those little differences between us, but they, they really don't matter. I love this quote from E.O. Wilson. I know um, Brandon loves talking about E.O. Wilson, but the, the reason I'm giving this talk is because we need synthesizers. We need people to put the right information together at the right time. And there's a lot of fake news out there, and we need people that make these choices and think critically about information. Um, I'm going to keep going. So the scientists are not the only, we're also at fault, right? So we have to be better communicators and educators, even to each other. So there's this large um, consortium that started this year to sequence the genome of every multicellular organism on Earth. And I'm beefing with these people because they're forgetting the conservation aspects. They're forgetting the people with boots on the ground who actually care about the organisms just in order to get the data with the hope of this trickle-down data that if we have all the genomes, we'll know everything. But we know very little. Even about, so there's almost a million human genomes done. There are less than a thousand plant and animal genomes. So there is this dearth of information, but they're forgetting some crucial stuff. And that's the museum people and the, the organisms behind this data. Because people will see this data and forget about the organisms. 10% of the genomes that have been done already for organisms have a specimen or, or something material related to that DNA. So if they sequence your DNA, they forget about you. Right? And so that's a problem. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this gigantic animal is the mola sunfish. And that species was split into four species recently. Um, it's an si animal the size of an elephant with the brain the size of a peanut. It's not the smartest cookie in the, in the jar. Um, and so these guys had their genome sequenced to see how, why did they get so big? And we can't really figure that out. So what they do is they correlate 
the genome of that animal with other things that are model organisms. Okay, so they look at zebrafish or something that they have in the lab where they can manipulate the genome to see what actually happens to the body. And that's problematic. That's correlation, not causation. In the last few years, we have the ability to create mutant strains. We can change the genome of organisms to see actually what happens to the body. That's a tool that we call CRISPR, or genetic modification. So this tool, CRISPR, came out a few years ago, and it, we've always been able to manipulate the genome. It just took a lot of generations to do that. Everything you have in the supermarket is best, basically genetically modified, just over time, slowly. CRISPR allows us to manipulate the genome very quickly, you know, in one generation. What that allows us to do is we have to start thinking about the ethics beside, behind some of this stuff. And this is not to scare anybody, but, you know, we have already started making designer babies, right? In China, you may have heard a scientist, not a very ethical one, um, there was two twins born with, that were genetically modified to protect them from the HIV virus, okay? It didn't go out, it did, the babies appear to be perfectly normal, but we're already in the era of designer babies. We have the genome of Neanderthals. What if somebody decides to bring back Neanderthals? Should we do that? Maybe, I, I don't think we should. What if, you know, nobody likes mosquitoes, but mosquitoes are the food of dragonflies and damselflies, and they pollinate, the males at least, pollinate flowers. Right? So we might have the tools now, especially with the new versions of CRISPR, to modify DNA and to lead to the extinction of actual species. So when I think about loss, I think about the loss of nature in its entirety. And artists are, are to blame too. People have been making transgender, um, this artist Edward uh, Kack made transgender, uh, not transgender, Transgenic, <laughs> transgenic rabbits to make them glow in the dark, right? People want to make butterflies. People are working on butterflies to make them show the Mona Lisa on their scales when they're swimming. Yeah. So uh, I like this book from Yuval Harari, um, Sapiens, where he says the intelligent designers, which is the anti-evolution movement, but they're wrong about evolution, but maybe they're right about the future and replacing natural selection, because we now have the ability to be the process of, of changing evolution in its entirety. So, I know that was a little scary. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the foods that we eat. I'm not talking about ourselves, really. I'm talking about what nature will look like if we allow these changes to happen without our consent, without um, the ethics behind it and thinking about it. I think scientists are thinking about this, but we need the public to understand what we're talking about. And so, that's why I wanted to talk to you today, and thank you for your time. <laughs> always, always in talks like that. Well, the sense of place uh, of our lab is the hot bags that we see on the show. Is the series of plant banks there on the offshore reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's not very far uh, from offshore. You see it's there on the, uh, yeah, okay. the continental shelf. And we have a whole series of plant banks offshore, which are salt domes, basically. And it's on those salt domes that we find the most wonderful seaweeds in the world. I think I've been all over the place, all over the world. But it's right here in our backyard that we find the most fascinating seaweeds. And uh, the sense of place was really shattered in uh, uh, 2010 because of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And uh, we're going to see that the oil spill uh, was very close to... Point to the computer. Yeah, I am. Uh, well, yeah. Was very close to our, some of our research uh, areas. And then we wanted to know what the oil spill uh, uh, told us about the importance of the um, algal nodules, that I'm going to show you in a minute, also called rhodonites, for the red stones, for the ecology and biodiversity of macroalgae, of the seaweeds, in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico, uh, in the habitats which we call mesophotic, and that means those are deep water 
70, 80, 90 meters depth, that still have enough light for the algae to grow, and because algae need to see uh, light. So this is all with uh, work done with uh, in my lab. And those home banks that we see here, it's a whole series in the northwestern Gulf from uh, Louisiana up to uh, the Flower Garden banks offshore Texas, and I was just there two days ago and I collected some of those algae. You see, they were collected here. Uh, and those hummings are associated with the salt dogs, 45, 90 meters depth. And you find them in the vicinity of areas of intensive oil and gas exploration. So you see all those um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah. So those banks among salt dog slopes where the, the, some parts trapped to have carbons. And the salt domes are basically 100% pure salt. And some of that salt can also convert into calcium carbonate or lime, and so calcium carbonate. And uh, so it's on the side of those uh, salt domes that you see all those nodules, which we call the rhodolites. And they, they are the basis for the hard substrata on in the northwestern Gulf. So that's at 80 meters depth. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't see anything. You have all those wonderful rhodolites um, that are full of calcium carbonate, and they are the ones that sustain that whole environment offshore. And we see here too that when we go with the ROV, uh, with the remote operation vehicle, we can see that you have all those, um, that was before the oil spill, uh, or when we go close to Texas, the Florigons, we see all those mounds and all those big kind of, uh, you, you know, those mounts of rhodolites. And you see, sometimes you see those little domes, and I brought that slide for the ichthyologist. That's a little sand type fish who makes those little domes. It's a little male, and then he has a whole bunch of little females inside here, and then you can see him visiting the little females. Really, really fantastic. So they are <laughs> ecosystem engineers. Uh, you see that here offshore Louisiana? and all uh, towards Texas. And here you see here how all those little um, not algal nodules are. You see all those little nodules with the whole, uh, that are covered by green and brown and red seaweeds. That's all over those rhodolite beds. Really, really fantastic. And before our work, hardly anybody knew that we have all those little nodules here offshore. And this is really the most important aspect of offshore algae, because you know very well if you go to the coast, it's hardly anything. It's muddy at the input of the Mississippi. But once you go like 40 miles offshore, it's fantastic. It's the most wonderful uh, area in the world, I think. And you see those laser points, that points to that 10 centimeters to get the center of scale. And you see here, we just, that's like in the flower garden banks, the northernmost coral reef in the, in the United States, offshore Galveston, where we just were there two days ago. It's a good thing I'm here today because it was stuck coming back. But you see here we have all those rhodolites, those calcium carbonate nodules, and then it supports those fleshy algae, etc. And then around you have all those little shrimp and the all fish and a whole bunch of uh, invertebrates, all living around those uh, algae. So, and then we go and we collect, and we see this plenty of beautiful, a great diversity of seaweeds that grow on those little nodules. So uh, we have those rhodolites. You can see this. They, they may look all alike to you, but actually they are different. Um, they belong in different orders, different groups. We have two different groups, but I, know, I cannot tell you uh, too much about it. But it's very, very various. And you see, we have like uh, soft corals, and uh, you know everything grows on those little calcium carbonate nodules. And in the field, you see there is a group, uh, those are different types of those rodents. And then uh, we find, uh, what, just like Cosanta is also interested in finding new species, we do. And we, we have been describing a whole bunch of new species, just from, uh, like those little nodules, for example, here. This is three different species. We just collected that in May, this one, and uh, all very, very wonderful. Huh? But when did we become more aware of the importance of those little nodules for the ecology of the algae and biodiversity in the, in the Northwestern Gulf? 
Well, that was unfortunately uh, with uh, the Port Horizon oil spill in 2010. And you can see here was where uh, the oil spill started, and those are some of our banks very close by. So you saw all that wonderful diversity that I just showed you with all the algae. And after you see Ewing Bank here, what we see, what we picked up, everything look dead. Those were nodules <coughs> that were teeming with life before the oil spill now look dead, were bleached and bare. It was just horrible. Uh, there was an, uh, and it had it continues up till this day, very close to the no, uh, East Louisiana, uh, Northwestern part, uh, close to the oil spill there. It just looks terrible today. If you go completely west. It's fine because they all didn't get it. So we, what we did then, we brought some of those dead looking nodules in the lab with water from the area we collected it. And then what happened a couple of weeks later, <coughs> from the surface of those dead looking nodules, everything started to teem with life again. Wow. So what was lost in the mm. ocean, in, uh, in, in the Gulf, in our little in all the um, tanks, everything started to come back. Yes. That was that was yeah. yeah, very, very incredible. It's a good thing we brought them because but we are such compulsive collectors. We're not gonna go <laughs> so far and not bring anything back. So and then we just waited and everything started to grow back. And you can see here, for example, uh, if you follow one of those little nodules. See this one, for example. You follow, and then after a month or two, everything's covered again. And what is so wonderful is that that diversity that actually started to grow back from those dead-looking nodules reflected the areas where we collected it. So you go from one bank, you're going to see those kind of algae. You collect from another bank, you see different algae. So that was absolutely fantastic, and we we had no idea before the whole spill. Yeah. So this became like a real sense of place. We were going to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And like that was done last year. Uh, and you see the rodents, those little nodules, they still, week after one week, they still look pretty bad. That they really look dead. But then a couple of weeks afterwards, you see, you can follow the little stones and you can see they completely go. So that mm -hmm. was really absolutely fantastic. So then, uh, you see, we get them in... Uh, that we collect, we collect them now in the labs, and so we got like I think 30 of those aquariums, and we follow them, and uh, it's very, very interesting. So, because of we saw all that life coming back, we view them as little seed banks for um, the, the basically for the growth of um, the algae, I mean, the whole ecosystem and seed banks, but it still needed to be demonstrated, and there also we got with. Um, Environmental sequencing. We, we, we look at inside those rodents, inside those, and then we find a whole bunch of. Uh, we had to put, we had to pick up some markers that uh, basically were able to pick up the, uh, the 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 algae that were photosynthesizing, and also bacteria and archaea. We had like there's a, a famous little um, area of, uh, that's very short but that we can also pick up with um, regular DNA sequencing. So we were able then, the whole idea was to link what's inside those little nodules, because we think they are seed banks, so they are inside those nodules, with the fleshy algae that were there before the oil spill. Huh? And we had collected over the years all those fleshy algae, so we had something to, to, uh, to relate it to. And then we can see when this is just for um, 16 s it's very interesting. It's, it's a plastic piece for, for the algae. And when you look at a big database uh, online for DNA sequences, we see in red there's a whole bunch of um, uh, sequences that come out as unprotein bacteria, etc. But in fact, it kind of comes back with all major groups of, in this case, red algae. So people don't know what it is. <laughs> because it didn't have the database to link it with what we had before. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are trying to do, uh, look at uh, more and more for everything. We find a whole bunch of, so those are the, the little pieces of sequences from within the, the 
the uh, nodule, we see that it's then part of the fleshy that it, we can actually say what it is because it comes, it relates to a big uh, algae. Uh, and CH1. Those are all those stuff that were uncultured. We didn't know what it was. When we know it's in that special group. So as more and more as we sequence both the, the, the large algae and then the tiny little things that were inside those nodules, we know that uh, they, they relate to one another, they link to one another. So that's really very, very exciting for us. So we continue working on that. And there's a great diversity. We have, we have different groups of rhododents. And then uh, what is very interesting, in one group like those, you see very tiny little uh, calcium carbonate nodules too. When we look at it with the scanning electron microscope, see these are all calcium carbonate. It's like hard uh, uh, lime, limestone. And we have like little openings, which are the cells, the cells here. And then uh, Sherry, uh, my student, she found inside those little cells very weird little stages. Nobody knew what it was. So um, then when we sequence it, we see that there are, uh, it's a group of macroalgae and uh, that were swimming in the tank, and, but also inside the cells of the, the rhodolith. So we were able to show that they have a life cycle that, is, um, that they need to continue the, the, the regular life cycle, the swimming life cycle. And so we saw that with different things, nobody had seen this before, but because you can see it fits, you know, that was free living and that was inside. So those rhodolites, those little really seed banks, because we have of the large algae, we have spores that are inside, and then we have those stages of those macroalgae, which basically are those bloom forming, or you know, those bloom forming algae. Well, when those bloom forming algae inside, we now know that a lot are in those uh, nodules, and then somehow they, they come out. And I can show you why. So you see all of those weird little structures. That's all <coughs> inside the cell of coralline algae. That's all lime uh, surrounding. Surrounding. Wow. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Really we didn't really know that for the old spell. We were, I was not even interested in those in those waterlets. Mm -hmm. I was just interested in those uh, fleshy algae. And then the idea is because you know some of those stages look like starch, but in order to look at starch, you, you can see you put some iodine on, and it's very very dark. So those this is the starch from the red alga, from the, 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 the coralline, the rhodolith. But then you see also some uh, lighter colors, and this is those weird stages from those macroalgae. And then you have some areas where you have both. Um, uh, uh, purple, which is the uh, the starch and the little algae. So we assume that those little cells, those weird stages, consume the starch for growth, and because they have to eat on something, so they actually cannibalize the starch of the red alga, and then they're going to be ready to to get out when the conditions are right. So the DNA sequence that we do demonstrates the importance of those. The uh, other nodules, those water, it's for the ecology and biodiversity in the Gulf, in those deep water systems. Because most of the work that, that has been done when we talk about the, the after the deepwater horizon was either very, very deep, uh, like 2,000 meter depth, or coastal. But we are there in, in, in the lim limbo, basically, that's 60 to 80 meters depth. You don't see anything, it's like out of sight, out of mind. But that area is basically so important to, uh, for the whole ecosystem of the area because all the fish and all of that live around those rodent events. So we saw that the interior of the marine diversity hotspots, and mainly hotspots that may function as seed banks in a state of dormancy, so like what seed banks do, and also as temporary reservoirs of unknown, of previously known stages in life stages of microalgae. And we have been able to de demonstrate it with different groups of macroalgae, all in those little nodules, weird stages we, we, nobody knew about. And then, uh, even though many of those big, large algae are still not present in the westernmost uh, banks, their little hidden stages are present inside, mm -hmm. with this potentiality of regeneration in the field, because you bring them to the lab and everything stops. So, uh, 
we also think that those life history stages are much more common than us uh, accepted worldwide. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at that. So our work showed that uh, those uh, the nodules are very important for understanding all the cycling of the algae community. Uh, the life cycle completion, regeneration, resilience, when something happens, like uh, the, the oil spill. And uh, what we do is we combine different types of sequencing to actually link the visible algae with the invisible algae and that are basically part of the same, the same organism. And then, so our oh, study have shown that it has opened the door to assess the universality of those little interactions by of bloom forming macroalgae to spanning all different groups in the marine ecosystem worldwide. And so it also taught us a lot about biodiversity, phylogeny, biogeography, and uh, we need to uh, work more now on uh, the importance to study historical samples. From you, you can go to the museums, like Kozaka said, we, we do, we have samples from way, way back, and we can now look at all the stages in this, uh, all the algae, etc. So uh, we can, uh, it's important to us as shifts in um, communities in space and time, the effects of global warming, of acidification of the ocean, because it's calcium carbonate, so what's going to happen is that the, uh, the ocean becomes too acid, it's going to dissolve. And like for coral, that's all calcium carbonate, so it's very, very important to, to understand all that. And then uh, also the contribution of those little, uh, nodules uh, uh, are going to be very, we know, is um, very important in understanding large scale ecosystem processes such as community structure, biology, or chemical cycle. Mm -hmm. Because I did talk about the bacterium, and so they are uh, very closely uh, linked to. And that's probably why they still haven't come back in the field yet. All those bacteria that got a shift to, you know, and we don't have to go in the in our plants. So also, it's very important to study to unravel the complexity of everything around those little nodules. Yeah? The whole of bio, the, the total organism, inside and outside. And the microbial, and all those microbes, predator prey interaction, the viruses. There's so much uh, talk now about the viruses mm -hmm. in, in the ocean. Uh, characterization and transfer of nutrients and energy. And all of those things we didn't really appreciate before the oil So basically, we learned that a great tragedy can open up new and exciting research avenues and approaches for study algal ecology and biodiversity. <laughs> there is hope, but then there is potential. But we don't really understand because it's so complex. What happens? Because you go to Ewing Bank, which was one of the uh, the most um, diversity rich areas, go there now, and it still hasn't recovered. But you go more uh, westward, and it's fine. But then it's not just the algae, uh, the crustaceans, the mollusks, all down. Because of course, so a lot of the the snails eat. The algae, the little crustaceans, the little uh, shrimp, all, all around it. So it's very important now. But then you can see we have little fish coming out of our tanks, but there were eggs attached to some of the, the, the nodules. Uh, we have snails, we have crustaceans, we have big sea salt. Suddenly they, they are there in our tanks. We never sell them because you see what we pick up looks dead. And then everything is back, uh, comes back. So we just want to um, tell we got um, funding from National Science Foundation to look at that. Mm -hmm. And it's really uh, uh, very, very interesting. So this is now our center of place. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The salt domes mm -hmm. offshore Louisiana and Texas. That's like the, uh, if we understand what's going on there, we're going to understand so much what's going on in other parts of the world. And I think the, it's those calcium carbonate modules that are like, uh, the basis for understanding the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where there is a lot of oil and gas, of course, because in the salt domes, that's where the hydrocarbons are. And it's on the surface of the salt domes that we have all those wonderful um, uh, uh, nodules mm -hmm. that we don't really see 
that much elsewhere in the world, except like in Brazil, and we have a lot of the same algae being mm -hmm. mixed in Brazil with those nodules, so, and the salt bird. So it's very, very interesting ecosystem. And like I say, we were not really uh, aware of it so much. We thought about it. So that's, that's very interesting. Then, uh, like I say, with hope and this, um, uh, with the, but we have a lot to do, but I think all together, uh, we have work till we're 100 years old. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, great to be in front of you. And I'm going to try to zoom through so we have some time to look at some of the specimens we brought today and draw them, taste them, do things like that. Um, so I'm a biologist and an artist. As a biologist, I'm a frog guy working in the fish lab with Prasanta at LSU. Um, speaking of loss, like a lot of my Art deals with loss, and a lot of my science deals with loss. As an amphibian person, one of the things that really, um, not only it, that, that stabs me every day is for about every year that I've been alive on this planet, we've lost about 1% of our amphibians. So frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. So I'm 45 years old, so I hate to say what that statistic is. Um, and it's on and on. So a lot of my work deals with that loss of biodiversity. But I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it other than saying we find ourselves right now in the middle of this mass extinction event. Did anybody read last week about the paper of losing 2.9 billion birds in North America since the 1970s? I and mean, that's phenomenal. And it's terrifying. Right? So it's, it's not just amphibians or birds. Um, uh, insects. I'm sure some of you have heard about the insect apocalypse we find ourselves in. So the, the whole idea of coastal loss is really reflective of what's happening on our planet right now. So we're losing cultures, we're losing species so rapidly. And I, and I hope by the end of the day we can talk about some positive things too and ways that we might be able to prevent that. But um, just to, to continue the conversation, some of you We've been talking about the oil spill. I assume everybody remembers that. Okay. Remember Matt Damon was there? Or was it Mark Wahlberg? I'm not sure. But um, I'll bring that up because I, uh, I work with students a lot. And in the memory of some of the students, like I was working at um, Grand Isle School last year. And the seniors all remember getting breathing treatments during the oil spill. But then they also remember like somehow that Mark Wahlberg was there. So it's like interesting the way people fuse memories together, especially young folks. Uh, but does anybody remember how much oil was spilled just statistically off the top of your head? A lot. A lot. <laughs> but it was cleaned up, right? No. Yeah. So it was around... Um, the guesstimate is about 200 million gallons, and now the further guesstimate is about half the oil remains in the Gulf of Mexico. So one of my first kind of artistic responses to that was literally going down, I was a volunteer, that's how I ended up in Louisiana um, in 2010, collecting specimens and trying to rescue oil birds, which never panned out. I never rescued a single bird, but I collected a lot of dead specimens, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, the, the thing is, even after the spill, specimens like this were being found. This is a red snapper from 2012 that was collected by NOAA. Um, so we got really worried about the impact of the food chain. And so one of the nice things about being an artist, it allows me to speculate in ways that I can't do as a biologist. So I was able to create, working with another team of speculative biologists, uh, this installation called Collapse which was shown in New York in 2012 and has been traveling since then. So this is literally about 22,000 preserved specimens, many of which I collected while I was trying to find birds and I couldn't find any birds. Um, I collected lots of other things. And then I met this whole network of folks in South Louisiana that then were shipping specimens to the gallery in New York. So I get a call from the, the, uh, the secretary and she'd be like, Brandon, another cooler from Alabama, right? Can you come get your dead fish? And I come down and I, I preserve them, and then it became this installation. 
And it really was supposed to be kind of a pyramid display that was kind of a memorial, but also just to show the complexity. This is only like 20, you know, 20, over 20,000 specimens representing about 400 species, which is only about less than 97% of what we think lives in the Gulf of Mexico. So if we had another 97 installations like this, like all compiled together, which I'd love to do, um, that's a little closer to what we know lives in the Gulf of Mexico as far as the biodiversity. It really, like I always tell people it's our Amazon rainforest. You know, like it, for the United States, it certainly is. And so for the, the spill to happen there, it's, it's certainly unfortunate. Um, so following that project, I um, called for something in like 2014 or somehow we met and I think I was in Wisconsin at the time. I said, hey, let's collaborate on some crazy idea. And we applied for this big grant from National Academy of the Sciences, and we got it, which was super. And we came up with the Crude Life Project, which I'm going to, more or less, I think it's better if you all get to experience instead of me talking about it. But as part of the, the project, um, in the beginning, we did this research element where we identified 14 species from preserved specimen collections around the United States that have disappeared since the spill, or haven't been reported. You can't say they disappeared, you just say they haven't been reported. So part of the goal was to create a kind of art science portable museum, for lack of a better term, and that's what we later called it, that we could go down and start to look for some of these specimens, but also try to work with members of the community to look for these missing fishes. And so um, the great thing about that is, as it started to travel, travel around different places, oh yeah, this is all the, I got to meet all these different folks. I even got to present it to the Louisiana State Senate and the Natural Resource Committee telling them about the missing species. And this was really great because from that, some of the senators helped me find more contacts with fisheries to try to look for some of the missing species. And we did find one, which was really great. Um, now, continuing that, you can imagine this has meant going to lots of collections around pulling out specimens that are 50 years old, have been sitting in formaldehyde for a long time, and they smell really good. So art and science is super glamorous. Yeah. And uh, the next thing to this, I kind of stopped counting when the sea chest had reached about 5,000 people two years ago. So it really like toured around quite a bit. And the next phase of this is me looking at not just those 13 that are still missing from the spill, but the fact that out of the endemics, the fish that are found in the Gulf of Mexico, nowhere else on the planet, um, about more than half of them we don't know very much about or have been missing for decades. So traveling around and then again working with shrimpers and fishermen and going to natural history collections to try to find these missing fish and essentially like look for missing species with endangered communities, communities that are also facing loss of their identity and loss of their land. And to do this in different ways, one way that I'm, I'm portraying them is I've been x-raying them. So this is a fish that was last reported in 2010, and then creating these large prints that look up like flags. Uh, this is another one, this is a stringy old. This one was last reported in 20, uh, 2004. Uh, this is a, a type of skate. And so um, there's some experimental printing techniques going into this stuff, which I'll maybe have the chance to show you. I think we're going to try to show them here next fall at the ACA. Uh, this is a great critter. It's, a, it's called an unnamed deep water dragonfish. Isn't that a cool name? Right? It was last seen in 1960. And the amazing thing is it's that big, pretty ferocious, huh? <laughs> so it was actually caught by accident in a, in a shrimp net. And somebody saved it, and it's in the Smithsonian now. Um, another thing that I'm doing to try to reach communities is I'm creating a portable version of Collapse. So instead of just bringing the sea chest, trying to bring like a full-on food chain and just park that in the marina and start talking to people. And then because as we talk about like loss again of, of communities, what's going to happen when these marshlands disappear is the shrimp are going to disappear. Right? So we're seeing these changes to the food chain. And by doing this, if I show up to a community unannounced as a biologist and say, hey, what are you guys catching? They're going to like not be very friendly with me, right? They're going to think that I'm there talking about quotas or something. I'm really interested in all the other things that they're catching along with the redfish and along with the shrimp. And see if there are unique possibilities there, how some of that bycatch can be used as potential food source, or also what 
data we can mine from those, those nets, you know, and what we can, what we still don't know. As Suzanne was saying, there's so many things about the Gulf that we're still trying to figure out. We know more about the surface of the moon than we know about what's going on in most of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so these are some of the communities that the, the crude life sea chest has visited. I'm really interested in working with rural communities, as I said, that are really in the coast and on the front lines of this change. Um, these are some of the slides from, from before. Um, this guy's taking a shelfie. That's probably the same slide. That, uh, so it's a deep sea isopod. I didn't bring them. I, that one's named Fluffy. I didn't bring them in there for her. They go both ways. Um, so Point Ashen, that's Point Ashen. Um, and part of the reason behind this, the underlying motivation is also science education in Louisiana. We rank the fourth worst in the nation. So some of the schools I'm working with, you go into the science classroom, the kids in their high school, they're seniors, they've never used a microscope before. So trying to bring this in and other artifacts to kind of have that conversation and just to kind of make sure that um, people aren't afraid of science but realize it's a tool that human beings created so that we all can hopefully thrive and learn from each other. Um, oh yeah, we need a pirate ship, but um, I forgot to mention that. But that's part of the idea. We're probably going to need a pirate ship at some point to travel it around. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.